Well, I started preaching on 1 Timothy last week, and I'm going to continue today. The first thing I want to do is this. So we're going to read through God's Word together. So please open your Bible. Set that, set that worksheet aside. Oh, worksheet is not a good word for it. Set that sheet of paper aside for just a moment. Let's read God's Word together so that we're all on the same page. By a show of hands, how many of you had time to read 1 Timothy chapter 2 this week? It's okay if you didn't. I asked you to do it last week. Great. Those of you that did, you are good Christians. Those of you that didn't are bad Christians. Yes, Lynn? My preacher read it to me on Wednesday night. All right. Um, I, that sort of counts. I'm not sure if it does or not. Uh, so let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And again, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. The, pew, the Bibles that are in the pews around you should be the same translation that I'm reading here. And let's read it together. We're going to read through the whole chapter. It's only 15 verses. And then we're going to kind of go through this outline that we've passed out to you. So 1 Timothy chapter 2. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. And I have been chosen as a preacher and apostle to teach the Gentiles this message about faith and truth. I'm not exaggerating, just telling the truth. Now I'm in verse 8 here, so keep following along with me here. In every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. Verse 9. And I want women to be modest in their appearance. They should wear decent and appropriate clothing and not draw attention to themselves by the way they fix their hair or by wearing gold or pearls or expensive clothes. Verse, four, verse 10. For women who claim to be devoted to God should make themselves attractive by the good things they do. Verse 11, women should learn quietly and submissively. Verse 12, I do not let women teach men or have authority over them. Let them listen quietly. Verse 13, for God made Adam first and afterward he made Eve. Verse 14, and it was not Adam who was deceived by Satan. The woman was deceived and sin was the result. Verse 15, but women will be saved through childbearing, assuming they continue to live in faith, love, holiness, and modesty. This is the text that we want to go through this morning. The first part of the sermon is pr pretty easy. Okay, and, and I think there's a lot we can get out of it, but I've just written down some things. So, so kind of keep your Bibles open as a reference, but we're going to kind of go through this here. Now, I don't do this very often. I don't give you a whole detailed outline of my sermon very often, and that's because it's not needed very often. But I wanted you to go home today and be able to know what I meant. And there's lots of different Bible verses that I've put in here. So you can say, well, preacher, I got a question about what you were saying. Hopefully you can be able to reference this and see the extra Bible verses that, that uh, kind of help explain what I'm talking about. Before I get into this, though, let me preface this. When I prayed earlier about my confusion about this passage, I was not kidding. I have been torn for many years about this passage. I don't I, it's hard for me, and I'm sure it's hard for many of you here in this, in this congregation. How many of you find it difficult to understand and wrap your mind around this, this passage here? It's okay if you do. Uh, and and I, I, am, I have struggled with it for a long time. When I was in Bible college at, at Moberly several years ago, this was 2004, uh, we took just a basic uh, written communications class, which, which is basic for any, any four-year degree. And for funsies, they made us write a paper about women in ministry. And you had, to, you, had to come, you had to come to a conclusion about whether you thought it was okay or not okay for women to be in ministry. 
and everybody had to write this paper. And since that day that they told us about this project, I have still questioned all of the things about this. So really, this here that we're going to look at together is just me struggling out loud about it. <laughs> Okay, and, and I'm free to change my opinion at any time. You might have something that you bring up to me and I've never thought of that before and vice versa. Hopefully this morning you'll hear some things that you're like, wow, I've never looked at it that way. Let me, let me put that into my brain and compute that a little more. So that's the thing that we're going through this morning is that A, I don't know it all and I am certainly not inspired like Paul the Apostle was to, uh, to have the perfect interpretation of this passage here, okay? So let's get into it a little bit. The first thing that I wrote down on this sheet here is this. Verses 1 through 7 should be read and under, understood together. There's really two different segments in this chapter. In the New Living Translation, there's a break after verse 8. I think the, the break should be before verse 8. I think the break should be, we're going to talk about men for a minute, and then we're going to talk about women for a minute, because those things go hand in hand. However, uh, this, that's not how it's listed in most Bibles there. Early Roman emperors would demand that you would worship them. Paul is flipping this concept on its head when he says in verse 2 that we should pray for kings, not Two kings. It was the practice of the early Roman Empire that in order to show allegiance to the king, you would pray to him and you would give him honor by doing that. It was a special thing to say to the to say about Caesar, we pray to you, Caesar, that you would save us from our calamity. This is, I'm not making up this up. This is very true. And so Paul is saying here, instead of praying to Caesar, pray for Caesar. And most of you have heard this before, but it is true. The Roman ruler at this time when Paul wrote this book was one of the most ruthless Roman rulers ever. His name was Nero, and he burned an entire section of Rome just so that he could build his palace there. People who were uh, of lower economic status died throughout that fire. Uh, for funsies, later on in his in his. Uh, in his rule, when the, the Christians were, he felt like the Christians were being too rebellious and were rebelling against the rule of Rome. He, uh, he went about and he would crucify Christians all throughout the streets of Rome. But what's more than that, as it got dark, you couldn't see the Christians very well on the crosses. And so he would light them on fire. That's right. As if crucifixion wasn't bad enough, you were lit on fire. This is the king that Paul says we should pray for. This is the ruler that is one of the worst rulers in Christian history. And we should pray for him. Now, I know some of you don't like Barack Obama. But this text here says to pray for him. What's more, it says that we should pray for him so that we will live loud and rebellious lives, right? Isn't that what the text says? What does the text say? That we will live quiet and peaceful lives. Hold, hold, hold up. Hold up. I don't like the rulers. I'm a rebellious person. But Paul here says, stop it. You know, this is very similar to what, uh, what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 29, 7. Let me just turn to it real quick um, because I've got it written here, but I want to read it to you a little bit. Uh, in Jeremiah's age, there were people that were, uh, uh, most of his countrymen were sent off into slavery. And so God said to Jeremiah, write this down to encourage the people. And I'm going to begin in verse 4. Jeremiah 29, 4, he says this. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives, all the slaves. Slaves, he is exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Now, they weren't allowed to marry the Babylonian people, but they were allowed to marry within their own culture. Then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply. Do not dwindle away and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. <laughs> 
You know, we get so mad at the things that go on in our country, and we have a democratic process, and we have the freedom of speech to say things when we disagree with them. However, that does not give us a right to be rebellious or angry at the government. Our goal should be, should be to live peaceful and quiet lives. And again, this is contrary to how I feel most of the time. But Paul commands it here. When you pray for your enemies, you'd be surprised how much you get along with them. When you pray blessings on that rotten president that you have during the time that you have him, you might be surprised at what you see in him, the good you might see in him or her. Folks, we have got to live quiet and peaceful lives. And Paul, Paul has commanded it here. Verse 3, or excuse me, number 3 on my outline here. It's certainly not a verse. It's certainly not holy. <laughs> Some people use verse 4 to prove that no one is going to hell. Because, quote, God wants everyone to be saved. This view, this theory, is called universalism. And if you've ever, if you've ever studied this stuff, if you ever talked to somebody who's a universalist, this is the very, very first verse that they will go to to prove their point. It says that God does not want anyone to, or God wants everyone to be saved, right? That's what the text says. However, that verse contradicts itself if they want to spin it that way. Many other passages in scripture say that, hey, you have a choice when it comes to salvation. You can either choose to follow Jesus who was sent here to die for everyone, or you can choose to follow your own selfish desires, follow Satan, and you'll get the punishment that Satan will get as well. Um, does uh, I put this in the notes here. I said, does God want everyone to be saved? What's the answer to that? Yes. Yeah, this text says that. <laughs> Will everyone obey God and be saved? No. 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 That's the sad news, right? Number four, pay attention to what God is saying to men in verse eight. He is saying to men that they need to be without conflict without drama you know the thing about this passage chapter two here is it paints this like a uh, stereotype of men who are rowdy and love to fight right and it paints this stereotype of women who are dainty and put on too much makeup and wear too much jewelry right and paul destroys both of these stereotypes he says, men, don't fight, don't quarrel. He says, when you pray, lift up holy hands. Now he's saying, he means it literally for that culture in that day. But when, when men lifted up holy hands, as if it, it was to signify that their hands were clean and purified. When Jewish people washed their hands ceremonially to prepare for meals and to prepare for sacrifices and things, they would dip their hands in a bowl and kind of rinse them this way. And then they would raise their hands up and the water would drip from their elbows, right? It was believed by priests that like, that's why God made elbows so that the water could drip off so that you wouldn't have to splash around and everything. Because if you used a towel, you weren't sure if that towel was clean or not. Okay. So that's what they did. They would rinse their hands and then they would raise up their hands because their hands were now clean and purified and holy. And so that's what that represents there. And he's saying this, men, men, Quit horsing around. <laughs> Get along with each other. Do not stir up conflict, right? It says they're uh, free from anger and controversy. Both of those two things are things that Tim Mitchell struggles with. I've got an angry side of me that I continually fight every day. And a lot of you men in this room struggle with that too. That you're quick to do battle. You want to do battle, right? Some of you in this, in this room that are men that are like, no, I just want to take it easy all the time. And that's, man, I envy you, right? But that's not me. I'm eager to do battle. And Paul is saying here, through the Holy Spirit, do not live that way. Let's keep reading. Verse 9. Here's where it gets a little slippery here to understand. But I think these first few verses are pretty basic, right? Again, this is the stereotype of what, of what a woman might be, right? A woman who is so concerned about her outward appearance that she forgets what really is attractive and what is really attractive the text says good works good deeds you know and that's the thing about about as you grow older men i'm looking at you men i'm asking you men as you grow older what's more attractive to you 
a good looking woman that, that takes care of herself or a woman who is kind and generous and hospitable? Which one's more attractive to you as you grow older? The second one, right? Yeah. Say what? Yeah, beauty is fading, right? And I'm, the, I'm not the proof of that. I've been this handsome for a long time. So I'm kind of breaking that rule a little bit. Um, and that's not fair to everybody else, but that's just the way God made me, okay? I'm glad we're laughing, okay? Because we're going to get real serious here in a minute. So that stuff, I think, is very simple. You know, Paul is saying, hey, women, you know, don't focus on your outward beauty. But that's so hard for women, isn't it? You know, Jenna, t Jenna has talked to me about that for years and years and years. She says, you know, I want to be pretty, and I want, I want you to be attracted to me, Tim. However, I don't want to cause other men to stumble, or I don't want people to think that I'm like, uh, that, I, that I'm wealthy because of the way I dress, and then they'll think I'm stuffy or something. You know, and that's the beauty, I think, about our church, is that we, we don't say it out loud, but it's kind of true. We say, you know, come as you are. You know, I've had several people throughout, throughout my, my uh, journey here at Buckland, you know, I'll invite them to church and they'll say, okay, well, what should I wear? And I said, whatever you've got on right now, you know, unless it's, you know, a bikini or something. I don't say that. <laughs> but it's true, though. We, and I love that about our church. Do you all love that about our church? That you, you can come here in, in, in whatever you want to wear and, and you feel comfortable. I hope that that's true, right? So, I, but I, I think that women struggle with that a lot more than men do, and I think that I don't, I don't have the wisdom or expertise to talk about that as much as maybe, uh, maybe a woman who is spiritually mature can. So let's jump into verse three, or excuse me, verse eleven. So here I am. I'm, I'm kind of, kind of look at the text, and we're going to go over what I've written here. I've written a ton of stuff here. Um, sometimes we view verses 9 through 15 as Paul bashing women. But in the greater context of the whole book of 1 Timothy, we see that Paul is telling men, women, widows, elderly men, and young people where their role is in the spiritual family. Folks, right here in this room, this is the family of God. And the family of God, and in, in, in just like every family, Everybody in the family has a role. And Paul, throughout this whole book, not just in this passage, is going to say, men, I, I want you to do this. Women, I want you to do this. Widows, you need to act like this. Young women, you need to, say, you need to do this. Elderly men, you need to do this. And so Paul has got instructions for every person within the spiritual family, okay? God gives women the same amount of benchmarks as men in this letter, okay? For example, we'll get to this in a, in a passage or two. Paul says, men, if you don't go out there and work for a living and work for your family, you are worse than an unbeliever. Oh, snap. No, he did it. Yes, he did. Man, people have been complaining about lazy men for a long time, haven't they? And it's true, and we'll get to that in a, in a few weeks. So let's keep going. Beginning in verse 11, the church has basically taken two big different stances on interpreting this passage. The first one is this. Women should not be leaders or teachers within the church, especially over a man. And we'll, I'll break that down in just a little bit. And the second one is we don't live in the same culture, time, or geography that Paul wrote in. Therefore, these guidelines don't apply to us today. So the people have looked at this passage and they've taken two big stances on it. So let's break down the first one here, and I've got it here. There seem to be additional passages that support this teaching. In 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 and 35, Paul says a very similar thing. He says, I do not permit women to speak in public. Now, in context, 1 Corinthians, boy, you read that whole book and you see that they're struggling with, with a lot of stuff. It is struggle city in Corinth. Because they're struggling with a man who's having sex with his, his father's wife, and the church thinks it's okay. They're struggling with homosexuality in chapter 6. They're tr struggling with prostitution in chapter 6. Uh, uh, in chapter 5, people within the church are suing each other. So there's lots of drama going on in the, in the city of Corinth. And maybe one of the reasons why Paul wrote that women, you need to be quiet is because women were causing a, a stir, maybe. I'm not sure. 
I wasn't there. We just read what we read. Titus 2.5 has a little bit of a hint of this as well. And, and, and Titus is written in the very same context that this book is written in. Instructions on how a church family should operate. Okay. On the other hand, this doesn't seem to line up with some other passages where Paul talks about women being equal to men. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Paul says this amazing thing. He says, you know, in Christ there is no longer Jew or Gentile. There is no longer a slave or free person. And there's no longer men or women. We're all on the same page when it comes to Jesus. It's such a beautiful, liberating passage. Or when women are recognized as deacons or leaders in churches. Romans 16 verses 1 through 6 says that. Now we're going to look at that in a little bit when we get to that point a little more later. So that's the first thing. Now I grew up in a church in Des Moines where women were not allowed to serve communion. They were not allowed to have prayers in the church service. Like if we had a church service, women were not allowed to pray. Uh, women definitely were never ever allowed to be deacons or deaconesses. They were not allowed to be elders. Um, and uh, that's just the way it was. They took this passage very literally and they tried to obey it very literally. In our movement, in our restoration movement, we are part of what we call the restoration movement. That is very, very prominent that women are not allowed to do this. How, how many of you know the history behind uh, our church uh, letting women be deacons and elders? How many of you know that history? I'm looking at somebody that lived that history right now. Betty King here was one of the very first deaconesses in our church uh, in, was it the 70s, Betty? Late 70s, if I remember right. Um, actually, it, the history of it goes back further. If any of you have one of the, the Buckland Christian Church um, history books, it says, I believe in the 30s, that, uh, that they voted to allow women to be elders and deacons. And then they had a crisis. Well, it doesn't really say what happened, but it says that they, they decided, no, 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 never mind, like a month or two later. And they shut it down. Okay. And I think that's kind of interesting. You can read that in the history of our, of our history books there, those of you that have those. Later in the 70s, what happened was that we looked at our bylaws and we said, hey, we need so many elders a year, so many deacons a year to serve, to, to take care of our church, and we don't have enough men to serve. And so our church began to allow women to serve as deacons, deaconesses is what we sometimes call them. And we'll look at that word in just a little bit here. And elders as well. So that's one of the reasons why we kind of switched into that in the 70s. And Betty King, again, was one of those first people. So it's kind of an honor to be in the room with her, isn't it? I think so anyway. I mean that. I'm not being, sar I'm not being uh, sarcastic when I say that. Uh, so let's look at number two here. So a lot of people say, well, that was just the time and the culture and the geography that Paul was in at that time. And we need to be careful whenever we say that. Because what we really are saying when we say that is, I don't want to obey God's word. I don't want to read it and, and pass it off. And I think that that's, a, that's not a good excuse at all. I think that's a horrible excuse. However, we do need to understand these things. Why would Paul write this? What was going on in the geography where he wrote it? And in this passage in particular, there is lots of biblical history behind what we're going to look at. So let's look at it. Letter B. I'm halfway down the first page here. We can't understand this passage without studying Genesis 2, verses 21 through chapter 4, verse 2. And in that story, you've got the story of Adam and Eve. Boy, I need to move way faster than I'm moving. Uh, okay, let's move faster. So you've got Adam and Eve. Eve is deceived by the serpent, and she takes a bite of the fruit because she sees that it is pleasing to eat, and she sees that it will give her wisdom. And that's crucial to this. Let me keep going. I'm on letter C now. Furthermore, this letter was written to Timothy, who was a young minister in the town of Ephesus. Chapter 1 says this in verse 3. Ephesus was known for its idol worship of Artemis. The Romans called her Diana. Artemis was a multi-breasted female god of the hunt, wild animals, wilderness, virginity, and childbirth. Now, I'm not just making this up, preachers making this up. You can read this on Wikipedia. You can read this in encyclopedias. In fact, in Ephesus, the, uh, the temple to Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the world for a long time. 
Okay, so this is fact here. Not only that, but you can read about what trouble Paul and Timothy got into for spreading the good news in Ephesus in Acts 19, 23 through 41. Great story there. I don't have time to get into it, but it is crucial to understanding that Diana slash Artemis was a big deal in this town where Timothy is written to. The Artemis cult was led exclusively by women priests and kept men out of religious leadership. You might begin to see why Paul is urging women to stay out of the leadership of this brand new religion called the Way. It was important that Christianity not function like the Artemis cult down the street. Here are some contrasts that Paul might be making in this passage. Okay? Now, I, I could be totally wrong. Or when I say Paul, I mean the Holy Spirit is inspiring Paul to write these. The first one is this. When Paul says in verse 13, pay attention, folks, this is very, very cool. Okay? When Paul says in verse 13 that God created Adam and Eve, part of what he is saying is that Artemis did not create Adam and Eve. And is actually fake. When Paul says that Eve was the first person to sin in verse 14, he is mocking the very notion that a sin created, excuse me, a sin creating woman could be a god. By the way, our god is sinless and beyond gender. You understand me here? Even though we call God our father, he is not a man, nor is he a woman. God is beyond sex and gender labels. I really believe that. Last one on verse on page one here. When Paul makes reference to childbirth in verse 15, he is mocking the fake fertility powers of Artemis. None of that is written in the text, but even if you study your own Bible, you can kind of begin to discover these things. That Artemis was a big deal in Ephesus, and Paul and Timothy just about get lynched because of it. Page 2, I believe Paul is walking on a razor's edge between two inappropriate ways to view women in the brand new Christian religion. Number one, the Artemis cult view, where women have all the power because a female God has granted it to them. Women offer sacrifices and men are not allowed to be priests. Number two is the opposite, the Jewish view, where women were only a step above the Gentiles when it came to their place in the temple. You know, you can look at layouts of the temple and you've got the outer core where the Gentiles could be, you had the court of women, and then you had the court of men, and then you had the court of priests. And women weren't allowed to go into the court of men or go anywhere into the temple, but Jesus has changed all that. He tore the curtain open to the holy of holies, people. Women were sometimes treated as property in wedding arrangements. You can read all about that, how to treat women fairly when you're trading in them. And in, in, you can read it in Exodus and Leviticus. Women traditionally were not taught to read. Women were not chosen to be disciples and never got the privilege of sitting at a rabbi's feet to learn deep biblical truths. How many of Jesus' 12 disciples were women? Goose egg. But how many women followed Jesus around in his ministry? We know of at least three, minimum. Luke, Luke's gospel and the book of Acts, more than any other books in the New Testament, talk about these women that were crucial to the ministry of Jesus. You, you've got to really put your women glasses on to see it because sometimes we just gloss over it living in the 20, 21st century. All right? Lastly, uh, excuse me, I don't want to forget this. Jesus broke this rule, by the way, with Martha's sister Mary in Luke chapter 10. Remember that story? Uh, uh, Martha comes in. She's been cooking in the kitchen. She says, Jesus, Mary's been sitting here at your feet listening to the, your stuff that you're saying. Make her get up and make her clean with me in the kitchen. And Jesus says, no, her place is right here at my feet. That breaks gender boundaries like you wouldn't believe. A woman allowed to sit at the rabbi's feet? Phew. Number three, the way. This is, this is Christianity. Instead, Paul is saying that women should be treated as equals. Galatians 3.28 says that again. And they have an honorable place in the home as childbearers and in the church as students and followers of Jesus. So women are now allowed in this brand new religion called Christianity. Women are allowed to learn and educate themselves and read and sit at the master's feet and understand what he is trying to say to them. No longer were you uh, uneducated, okay? Next part, I don't think this passage teaches. Now, again, this is my opinion here. I don't think this passage teaches, A, that women are worthless, 
Paul knew firsthand how much women meant to the fledgling Christian religion. Many of Paul's first converts were women. See Lydia in Acts chapter 16. B, that women should always keep their mouth shut and never ever teach a man. Acts 18.26 has a story about Priscilla, a woman, and Aquila, her husband, teaching Apollos about Jesus where? In private. You know, Apollos was going around teaching these things that weren't quite true, and they said, Apollos, come here. We want to help you in private. Every time Priscilla and Aquila are mentioned as a couple in the Bible, Priscilla comes first because she was the dominant person in the relationship. And Paul praises her again in Romans chapter 16. Let her see. I don't believe this, te- this passage teaches that women can't have authority or serve in the church. Romans 16, 1 through 5 talks about Phoebe's deacon status in the church at Centria. Let's turn there real quick. Man, I'm trying to move faster here, folks. Romans 16. Please turn in your Bibles there. Please, please turn in your Bibles to Romans 16. Verse 1. We're almost done. Romans 16, 1. It says this, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a deacon. Some of your Bibles call her a deaconess or a servant. The Greek word is deacon. It is not a feminine word. There's no such thing as a deaconess in the Bible. There is only deacon. Just like you can call a woman an actor, the word actress is not really appropriate. Men and women can be actors. This is the same thing. Paul, the same guy that wrote this passage, is saying... There's this lady over in this church. She's a deacon in the church. She has some kind of role of authority or responsibility in that church. That's our big deal. Welcome her in the Lord as one who is worthy of honor among God's people. So not only is she a deacon, but Paul is saying here, she is worthy of honor. Okay? So let's not be misunderstood here. Help her in whatever she needs, for she has been helpful to many, and especially to me. Verse 3, give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in the ministry of Christ Jesus. In fact, they once risked their lives for me. I am thankful to them, and so are all the Gentile churches. Also give my greetings to the church that meets in their home. He is saying here, these two women, Phoebe and Priscilla, although to you and I they might seem like footnotes at the end of a letter, they are important. They're important for us to realize that women, even in Paul's day, had some kind of authority on some level. Okay? So let's keep reading. Uh, Letter D. That women find salvation from... I don't believe this passage teaches that women find salvation from sin, death, or hell through childbirth. You know, I don't think it's saying, hey, ladies, you must deliver a baby or you're going to hell. I do not think that's what verse 15 says. Okay? Now, I know it kind of sounds like that when you just read it flat out. Okay? Um, This is kind of my twisting of it. And I could be 100% wrong. And I'll show you where I get this from. Okay? Here's my rewording of how I get this. Salvation does not come by having children. Rather, when or if a woman does have children, she will be safe. The word salvation also means safety. She will be safe from God's wrath. If she is faithful and loving, etc. Now, here's a version of this passage. This is a translation that I really like. Now, again, it twists some things. And this guy is British, so he's got kind of some British words in here. So it doesn't completely translate to our American English. Uh, His name is N.T. Wright, and he is a very, very educated man. He's not just some schmuck. And he's a very conservative man as well, so let that be known too. Let me read it to you here. Verse 11. They must study undisturbed in full submission to God. I'm not saying that women should teach men or try to dictate to them, rather, that they should be left undisturbed. Adam was created first, you see, and then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and fell into trespass. That's another word for sin. Verse 15, she will, however, be kept safe through the process of childbirth if she continues in faith, love, and holiness with prudence. Now, to some of you, that sounds like the exact same thing I wrote, but if you parse that up a little bit, it is quite different. Now, again, this might be just Tim twisting it so that he'll feel comfortable about it. And that might be the truth. But I want you to struggle with it because Paul has put it in God's word because he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And when God says something, you better be quiet and listen and try to obey. 
Let me finish here. Questions we must ask about this women, about women from this passage, and my answers are only educated guesses. They might be a bunch of junk. A, what does it mean to exercise authority in the context of the church? People in authority are actually called to be the biggest servant. The kingdom of God is backwards from the world. The world says leaders need to rule over people with law and order. The kingdom of God says leaders need to serve the needs of even the weakest within the kingdom. So when we say, man, I do not let women exercise authority over the church. Well, Paul would say, I don't let men exercise authority over the church. He would actually say, I would let Jesus exercise authority over the church. Are you tracking with me here? The word authority here, you've got you to check that, okay? Because really, if you want to be a leader in the church, you've got to serve on your hands and knees. Are you tracking with me here? So we have to understand that when we talk about authority in a church. Letter, uh, letter B. Is it a sin for women or woman, for a woman, to speak in church or teach men or be an elder? Although I take Paul's words as inspired by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 3, 15 through 16, Peter himself says Paul's words are equal to that of the Holy Scriptures of the Old Testament. So I, I believe what Paul is saying it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I believe Paul is being serious about obeying his words. I do not believe they say that women are sinning if they speak, teach, or lead in a church. I don't think Paul anywhere says a woman is sinning and she needs to repent of this if she's doing that. And if you can find me a passage where she says that, man, I'll double back and I'll say, man, I agree with you. But I don't, I don't see it in this passage. I think Paul is just trying to say, this is what God wants. Right? And there's an order to this. Okay? Although it's not a sin, I do think this is the way that God desires His church to function. Otherwise, He wouldn't have laid it out in Holy Scripture. I believe God wants godly men to lead with purity and godly women to follow and learn in purity. The entire book of 1 Timothy is about the spiritual family and the roles that they should fill. Let her see, and then we'll be done. When a woman has a child, what is, this, what is she safe or saved from? Man, this is the hardest question in this whole passage. She might be saved from death while in labor if she is faithful to God. Paul was, Paul was known to warn people against sinning because God might strike them dead. 1 Corinthians 11 says, if you take communion in the wrong attitude or spirit, God can kill you in that time. Unless you think, whoa, that's, yeah, really, is God going to kill me if I take communion wrong? Do not forget Acts chapter 5, and I believe our adult Sunday school class is going through Acts chapter 5 where God strikes down two people who lie about their offering in the middle of a church service. Paul is serious about this, deadly serious. So maybe that's what he might be saying, question mark, I really don't know. The next, the next guess is she continues her family legacy through her children, right? When you have children, your name gets passed on. Who you are, your DNA continues through that child. So in an essence, you are living through to the next generation in a weird, twisted way, right? I don't know if it's twisted or weird, but that's kind of true. She follows in the footsteps of her oldest grandmother, Eve, who in Genesis 4-1 gave God all the credit for helping her deliver her first son, Cain. You know, it's, it's, it's a theory that when Eve gave birth to Cain, she said, Oh, God has blessed me. He has helped me deliver Cain. There's a theory that Eve thought that Cain would be the Messiah, would be the chosen one, the one that would save them and restore them back to the Garden of Eden. Right? Can you, can you imagine Eve being pregnant for 40 weeks and finally through all of her labor and the, all of the pain and turmoil of labor and she's never, she's never been in labor before and neither has any other human before. What is it, how does it work? What do I do? How do I sit? How do I stand? What do I do? And she delivers this baby and she says, Lord God, you have saved us. You have helped us. Fast forward three verses later and Cain kills somebody. It's the opposite of what she had hoped for. There's so much sin already in the world and it's only in Genesis chapter 4. Just the world is just rotten with sin. And so, this, although this passage is confusing, I hope that I've maybe shed some light on how I feel about it. And I'm still like arguing with myself about it. I don't know if you can tell that. <laughs> 
Maybe, maybe I've muddied it up more than ever. And maybe that's a good thing. Let me come back to what Paul says in the beginning of this chapter, though. There is one God and one Savior, and that is Jesus Christ. And no matter how we practice church, He is to be the head of our church. And folks, if you don't believe in Him, I'm going to give you an opportunity to say yes to Him today. We're going to sing a song of invitation. It's called He Lives. It's hymn number 164. I love this song. And as we sing it, if you feel like God is tugging on your heart, if there's junk going on in your life, you need prayer, if you need counseling, come see me. Uh, if you need prayer or if you, if you feel like, man, I need, I need to make a decision for God, come down today and I'd love to chat with you about prayer or a decision for Him. Uh, would you stand as we sing this hymn together? Hymn number 164, He Lives.